genuinely want to take your life to the next level, then you gotta hit the reset button. Welcome to another episode of the show. It's 9am right now in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm pumped to have Jarek Robbins on the line with me. Jarek, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Good morning, Australia, for everyone tuning in over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jarek, I had a look at your TED Talk last night, and it totally resonated with me, man. Um, especially the part when you went overseas and you had that whole adventure. Um, I just want to add that when I was 18, I went to a small village in Pakistan and I was touched by the fact that even though people had so little, and I mean little, um, they were so excited about life and they appreciated what they had, something that, you know, us in the US, in Australia, in first world countries, Sometimes we overlook that and we just chase the dollar and we're not thinking about um, appreciating what we have. But um, I know that you know that it's also about giving. It's a third step in your book, Live It. Um, Jarek, can we go right back to the beginning and find out about you and the journey that you've been on so far? Sure. Um, I, in, in what you're saying, I think is important too. I, I think it, there's a sad statistic that says only about 11, 11 to 13% of Americans have a, have an actual passport, um, which is frightening to me just considering the fact that it, it is a privilege to be in a country that at this point in history has the ability to go to so many different countries around the world. Australia has that privilege. There's a bunch of countries that have the privilege to travel to so many other regions without being stopped, without being questioned, without being detained, without being really bothered much for going in and out of all kinds of countries around the world. And, and it's sad that, you know, let's say max 13% of the country actually takes, even has a passport. That doesn't mean they actually travel. That just means they have a passport. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, 200 million people, three, two, 300 million people, and, and only 13% of them actually even own a passport to do anything with much less consistently travel outside of the country and see the world. Uh, I, I think there's groups of people that hear that fact and they're like, wow, that seems crazy. But we start creating circles that we hang out with or people that we communicate with or we have that one family member. We get around other people and, and they start to make it seem normal. Or you look on Facebook and you always see people traveling, so it seems normal. Yeah. The crazy yeah. part is that it's really not normal. Like if you look at family, I remember when I was in college, I got to take a really rare opportunity, which was called Semester at Sea, where we did a 110 day voyage all the way around the world and we circumnavigated the world on a ship. And, and that's like a wow. crazy rare opportunity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, it's not that crazy because we have the technology where we can have internet in the middle of the ocean and be chatting with people. Um, but you know, people have been doing that now for over 50 years. And my thought is when you see the pictures of the ship they used to go around the world as students on and 50 years ago, I'm like, those were brave people <laughs> <laughs> to get on that ship and cruise around the world. Yeah. You were a brave human being. <laughs> Um, you know, it's like the first person who went west in the United States. Like you were a brave soul to just go that way. Like you, your wagon gets the other side of the country and like five people are dead. You have a baby that wasn't there before you left. Like things are crazy. Mm. Um, but, but in looking at that journey, getting to go around the world and getting to see and set foot in so many different places from villages to major cities um, to the farmlands of Thailand and, and getting to live in a schoolhouse and teach English there. Um, to, to Soweto and, and, you know, the different places in South Africa, to rural villages and, and reserves in Kenya wow. and Tanzania, to the, you know, favela, or what is it called? The um, that's the wrong... Favela? Like favela. I think it was in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. The, the tougher parts of town. And it, and it was crazy. Like, we were given instructions. It's like, green, yellow, red. Green, you're fine. Yellow, you're okay. Red, the police won't even come help you because... You know, it, it's run by the society and the community there. And if you cross that line, the police won't even go in there to help you because the police don't have any effect on the community. It's community wow. rule. Wow. And it's like, wow. And, and you get to start to understand the fact that not only people have different worlds they live in, but as you start to experience those different worlds, you start to see the fact that it's like, wow, everyone's got different things they're t thinking about every day. 
One right. person's worried about like, will I have food tonight? Another person's saying, hey, am I going to be safe when I fall asleep tonight? Another person's thinking, hey, like I'm trying to watch the game on TV, so shut your face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. so weird. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like this is crazy. And then you go to one country and people have huge houses with like two people that live there. You go to another country, people have tiny houses with like four generations that live there. So you got like grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt. Mom, dad, brother, sister, and like cousin, and everyone lives in the same house, and it's two bedrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're like, wow, yeah. we're one bedroom, and everyone sleeps on the ground, yeah. and and it just yeah. blows your mind because you see so many different ways of life. The crazy part is though, no matter what village you're in, no matter what city you're in, no matter where you're at in the world, there are some similarities. Okay. And you know, one thing that's similar that I've seen across the world, which is something we focused on, which is. When, when someone becomes of age, and of age is very different in different places around the world. Of age, you know, when you become of age as a young man in the Messiah tribe, somewhere around 13, 14 years old, there's a transition ritual of how they make you a man if you're a boy. Okay. And the transition ritual of the Messiah is all the men paint their faces, they, they, they show up, they all plan it so you don't know, you're sleeping. And the way the Maasai tribe works, just so people know, is it's a circle yeah. and they're, they're moved. So they break down their village, they go somewhere, they rebuild their village, and it's always the same. Um, they, they're a grazing type society because they have cows and the cows need grass to graze on and that's their, their main source there. So mm -hmm. what happens is in the very inner circle is a cow ring where they put the cows. Then they put little huts around it for the women and children to sleep in. Mm -hmm. Then they put a thicket fence of thorns around it, and then the men sleep on the ground outside to protect against the lions at night. Wow. Wow, that sounds like... So you're sleeping at night as a man. In case a lion shows up, you can protect your village. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have guns. They have spears yeah, and, and arrows. So that's so primitive. Just, yeah. yeah, get a thought process of how it works. Like... Yeah. It's just a different way of life. And, and again, they have different problems, but similarities. And I'll talk about the similarities in a minute. But when you become a man in the Maasai tribe, they kidnap you at 13, 14 years old out of your mom's hut. So they grab you by your ankles, throw something over your head. You don't know what happened. They drag you out to the middle of the forest, all the boys at that age. They have like a, they un, you know, take the thing off your head. You realize it's your uncle and your cousin and your brother and you're not going to get killed. So you're like, oh. Um, but then what happens is they do a ritual, they do a thing, and then they say, hey, we're going to leave you out here for a year um, to learn how to become a man. Okay. And we want you to learn how the basics of what a man really is in this community. And a man in this community is someone who knows how to feed himself, protect himself, and take care of himself. And they said, if you can't do that by yourself out here in the middle of the forest against all the animals in nature, you cannot serve of value to society and our community because if you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of our village? If you can't defend yourself, how are you going to defend the village? Hmm. If you can't feed yourself, how are you going to feed the village? Hmm. Hmm. So you're probably going to die if you can't do those things, and that's sad, but you don't serve value to the village, so you probably should. I don't think they put it that way, but that's my interpretation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Think about it. You know, if you go to Oz or, or America or Canada, it's like, what's the ritual? Let's get them drunk and show them some boobs. Like, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> hey. And that's like a night out. That's, that's a night out on the weekend, you know? Yeah, um, but we wonder why do people have trouble finding their purpose in society nowadays? Because we don't direct them to what it is. We say, no, it's up to you. Do whatever you like. You know, serve whatever purpose you think. It's not how, what value can you add to our society. It's just saying, hey, do what makes you happy. Do what feels good. Whatever you like, go do that. And that's great advice because it makes people feel happy, but not long term because they lack purpose. They lack meaning. They lack the connectivity to say, hey, this is what I really have purpose in society about. So what's interesting about that? Is when you think about it, winding that back together to how I started is I started as a young guy looking for my purpose, my value, what gifts I had that I wanted to share with the world. Mm -hmm. And in looking at that, I grew up with a unique background where I grew up around the personal development industry my whole life. Um, my mom was going to seminars when I was in her belly, literally um, teaching people how to break bricks as a metaphor for breaking through fear. 
Um, I, I grew up at seminars all over the world watching millions of people go through <laughs> self-help training. I've listened to all the tapes and all the books and everything that everyone's come out with. And I always hear who's the newest, coolest guy on the block. And I have grew up around that. So I had a really in, you know, interesting perspective of the self-help industry because I got to grow up in it. And I was listening to those things since I was literally in you know a baby in my mom's stomach. I've been listening to this stuff all the way through. And I'm 30 years old now. So 30 years of this stuff, it, it adds up. And what's fascinating, though, is not only listening to it and not going, oh, yeah, that's what my mom or dad's into, or oh, yeah, that's what they're into, but really submersing myself into it where I would go read the latest book or go listen to the latest seminar or go attend you know, the next course on it. And I'm always reading. I just ordered, I think, 12 books on the coaching industry. I've been coaching for 12 years now, yeah. but I just ordered 12 more books on code of ethics, law around coaching, um, dynamic questions. Uh, all kinds of stuff because I'm always learning and always growing in my field and I want to know what's the best in the information available and how do I access it. And I've had that um, kind of way of life since I was 15. Wow. So 15 wow. years now I've just been studying and learning and aggregating as much as I possibly can as far as information and just gathering the best of what's available. And at one point, uh, right about 10 years ago, I decided I was going to write a book because I knew all this stuff. You know, At 20 years old, I just knew it. And what happened was I sat down, I wrote 98 pages of a book, and I realized I knew it, but I haven't lived it. <laughs> okay. And right. It's like, right. I know the tools, I know what to say. As a matter of fact, this is the sad part. You could put me with a client, and I could teach them how to have the perfect life and go you know, achieve their dream. Not perfect, but how to achieve their dreams, how to get the results they wanted, how to be healthy, happy, fit, fulfilled, whatever they were after. I could show them exactly how to do it. The challenge was I didn't feel that way about my life. You know, I was stuck in a position where mm, some days I was happy, some days I wasn't. I was stuck in a position where, I, you know, at one point I was working a job that I didn't really love. I was doing it because I wanted approval from someone else. Yeah, you know, at one yeah. point I was working three jobs that I didn't really love, but I was doing it because I had to pay the bills. And I'm like, man, like, I know how to get out of this stuff, but why am I still stuck in it? And it was a weird moment for me where I sat down. I'm like, okay, this is weird. And I just took out all the tools that I've been sharing with people. And I said, okay, let's just use each one and see what happens to the fullest extent. I'm just going to do it every day, no matter what, to the fullest extent. Yeah, yeah. And I started doing it. And as you can imagine, some of them got really, really, really phenomenal results. Now, others of them didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and learned was uh, what I learned was everyone has certain tools that work and, and you know not only work but they work specifically for them in their life mm -hmm. and I think every person's different so my thought is like there's if you start at level one which is like a single human being man or woman on the planet level one stage one this first little step is basically that moment of life where let's say you're old enough to transition into the real world so you have to go get a job in the Messiah, it's 13, 14 years old. Some countries, it's 18. Yeah. Some countries, nowadays, it's like 35. I, I don't know when your parents pick you out and you're like, you're on your own, son. Whatever <laughs> age that is. Yeah, I, um, I, left, I left when I was um, 19. Uh, yep, yeah. I was 18, so right around the same spot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, nowadays, I mean, honestly, some people don't leave till they're like 55. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm like you need to figure it out because when i die you're screwed if you don't <laughs> that's right that's right yeah it's it, sad but that's happening and and so let's say 18 let's just be easy 16 to 18 you're, yeah, you're on your own yeah, yeah. and what happens in this first chunk of life is, is really it's like a tornado hurricane sandstorm dust storm you know wild moment in life when you're trying to figure out what works <laughs> and you have no clue yeah. you're like you know 18 years old like i'm gonna go make a million dollars you don't yeah. Yeah. dollars is it 18 you have no clue how much money that is like shit most people try to figure out how to make more than like 20 bucks an hour <laughs> you're just like dang like i made too much money <laughs> or you know I'm going to go be the healthiest guy I could be in the world at 18 years old. I mean, watch most 18 year olds at the gym. Like they're lifting way too hard. They don't rest their body. And because they're so young, they repair fast. But over time, if they're 50 and lift weights like that, they're going to hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's really learning not only what works, but what's sustainable, what really works in the long term and longevity and health versus just fitness or shape, you know, and then like happiness. I rarely meet 18-year-olds that are just purely happy and fulfilled with their life. 
um, I really meet 50 year olds that are happy and fulfilled with their life. <laughs> you know, most people struggle with this concept, and there's lots of books written about it recently. Um, but to find someone who's truly fulfilled with their life, usually at 18, some days you have it, some days you don't. One day you're happy, one day you're frustrated. One day it's good, one day you're pissed. Like, you don't know, you're all over the place. So, and then relationships, holy hell. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> young men usually have their eyes guiding them on what most important is in a relationship. Uh, young women, some of them mature very quickly and they, they just get it. They know what they're looking for. Others, um, they go down a path where they learn they have a lot of power mentally, emotionally, physically, and, and they start to use it at 18 years old to get what they want out of a relationship. And eventually they get sick and tired of the guys who won't stand up for what they believe in and just like bend like a twig every time they mm. want something emotionally, mentally, physically from them. Mm. And that's a tricky stage where relationships, they surely usually don't have it matched up yet either. So you can tell it's just this craziness of life. And I always call that level one, stage one. Now, what's really interesting, when someone goes from level one, stage one, to level one, stage two, this is when they figure out what works, but more importantly, what works for them in their life. Okay. That's an important fact because what happens is a lot of times people eventually will get so frustrated with level one, stage one of not knowing what works in life, not knowing how to be happy, not knowing how to be healthy, not knowing how to get the job they want, that they'll start looking for answers. They'll Google it. They'll read books. They'll go to seminars. They'll listen to tapes. They'll do something to try to find answers. And what's interesting is as they find answers, usually the first person that makes sense to them, they latch on and treat this person like, the most amazing guru they've ever met in their life. They're like, this guy knows all the answers. <laughs> and, and if you've ever had a friend like that, you're like, oh my God. <laughs> you're like, they're okay. They know some answers. They're very smart. At the same time, they don't know everything. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Huh? It yeah. Usually yeah, drives you true. nuts when your friend gets hooked on this one person who knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> knows everything. So it's like, okay, they know some stuff, but from what they know and what you're learning from them, here's the question I'd ask. What works, but more importantly, what works for you? What works in your life that when you do, let's say that morning routine that way, oh man, I feel amazing. Or, you know, when I do this certain mindfulness meditation, my world is just, you know, blissed out and beautiful and peaceful. Or when I work out this way, I wake up with tons of energy, but when I work out that way, I wake up feeling like crap. <laughs> you start to realize what works and what works for you. Even in diet, you know, when I eat this stuff, feel horrible, eat this stuff, feel great. You start to realize this is what works. Now, what's tricky in level two, one, stage two, is you start to really understand the fact that you know what to do and it comes in a very specific sequence and order. Meaning if you wake up and then do this and then do this and then do this in this exact order, so wake up, meditate, go for a run, work out, eat healthy, get my juice, drink some wheatgrass, say my incantations, read this book, and then go to the office. Mm -hmm. If I do it in that order, my life is fantastic. But here's what's crazy. If I do it in a slightly different order, like if I miss my meditation, I hate to say it, but when I get to work, I'm going to be a total a-hole and jerk because I miss my meditation and I'm snapping at people emotionally. Reactive mode. Yeah, mm. because one piece was missing. Mm. And what's tricky is people become dependent on this perfect schedule. And if it's not perfectly in order, and, and I always say it's very effortful. It's very difficult to do the right thing at the right time, at the right place, in the right way. In the beginning, it's difficult. Um, but there's a great book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And what he talks about is when you can identify how to build a habit into your routine and how to get rid of the negative habits, you can now give yourself the ability to learn how to do the right things consistently, very easily, very effortlessly. And so level two is effortful. Level one, stage two. Stage three on level one becomes effortless. Mm -hmm. It's when you identify what works for you in your life specifically and you build it into a habit, you build it into a routine to the point that it's almost effortless. You just wake up and do it. And at that point, when I finally hit that point, um, that's when I decided to write this book okay. because I figured out how to be happy, healthy, fulfilled as a single individual human being 
to the point where even I, I, I had it done well enough to the point that someone could come and totally screw up my schedule, screw up my week, jack up my routines. And within a day or so, I might get jacked up and go right back to the right things to be happy, healthy, fulfilled, and have a really joy-filled life, feel tons of purpose, tons of meaning, and be doing things that I love and being paid very well for it. Hmm. And it's like, wow, I did it. I figured myself out as a human being. You lived it. Now, I lived it. I was living it. And that's what the book is all about. The book is designed to show people how do you design that ideal day? How do you design that perfect day that if you were living that kind of day, you'd be happy, healthy, fulfilled, abundant, blissed out, just amazing. You'd have it. You know, what are the things that are getting in your way? How to get rid of those? Who are the obstacles or how are the obstacles to show up? How to make it through them? How to fall in love with the process? How to all the steps are in there over 10 years experience with myself, but then sharing all those tools with other people and having now thousands of people gone through our programs and get similar, if not the same results themselves. Okay. That's what okay. step is about. Now, what's interesting, that there's, a, there's a really important thing that happens is you get to the point where you master yourself as a human being, but then you kind of hit the next, you get ready for level two, and you realize level one, even if you master level one and you're a single human being, happy, healthy, fulfilled, blissed out, totally centered, like you own yourself as a man or woman, the, the challenge is if you don't have someone to share life with, it doesn't feel like it's worth much. So all of a sudden you have to look around and go, wow, I got to find a partner, you know, a partner in fun. I got to find someone to share my life with, share this journey with, share these moments with. And in that moment, you get ready to graduate to, you know, level two. Now, here's what's crazy, just to give you guys some insight. The moment you graduate to level two, you immediately get kicked back to level two, stage one, which is that crazy hailstorm, thunderstorm, tornado, hurricane at the same time, except for it's two people. <laughs> <laughs> Holy right. shit, they wake up at 6 a.m., I wake up at 11. They go to bed at midnight, I go to bed at 4 a.m. They eat, they eat vegetarian, I eat meat. Ah! <laughs> it's so crazy. It, it's, it's a unit. So it's like a unit of these two people become one. Um, and, yeah. And, well, and, they're and, supposed to become one, but in the beginning, they are sure as hell not one. <laughs> <laughs> they are two separate people with totally crazy different lives, with totally different schedules, with totally different ways of living, totally different rules, beliefs, values, just off different worlds. Yeah. You try to put two worlds together, it goes crazy for a while. Now, what happens after so long, though, is again, you hit level two, stage two, which is what works and more specifically, what works for you both as a couple. Again, it becomes very effortful. If you do it the right things in this order, in this way, with each other, everything's blissful and amazing. You do one thing out of order, shit falls apart and goes haywire. But if you get it all done right, it's very effortful. It's very effort. You have to focus on it. Try really hard. But as long as you do it right, you have this amazing relationship. Mm. Now, eventually what happens is you figure out how to kind of automate it and systematize it and build it in the habits and routines as a couple. Becomes blissful. You master level two. At that point, you decide to have a baby, level three. Shit goes haywire for six months. The kids break, you know, pooping on you and Shit. barfing on you at 2.30 in the morning, then four, then seven, randomly, you never know. <laughs> you, <laughs> craziness, you figure out what works, you master it. That's as far as I can see as a 30-year-old, you know, just married guy. But here's what I'll tell you. The biggest mistake people make is before mastering level one, which is themselves in life, they jump into a relationship thinking it's going to be the solution for them feeling lonely and they never figured themselves out and now they're trying to figure out themselves and someone else at the same time. Hmm. The second hmm. biggest mistake people make, they never figure themselves out level one. They go have sex with somebody, have a baby and immediately graduate to level three. They never figured out themselves. They never figured out the other person as a couple and sure as hell, good luck figuring out all three of you as a family. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, there's nothing wrong if you act if you made those decisions already and you're in a you're married and you haven't figured yourself out or you had a baby and you're not married and you haven't figured yourself out the key is grab a resource and start figuring yourself out as fast as humanly possible to get through that level 1 stage 1 2 and 3 and get yourself handled at that point your focus changes in life because it becomes not about how do i handle me it's like hey i'm good I'm happy. I'm fulfilled. I'm I, I'm good. I don't need anything in life. Like I am abundant as a human being. Your whole focus becomes how do I serve others? At that point, you're actually really ready for that relationship you're in because your whole focus becomes how do I serve them? Hmm. I'm full of 
abundant. I'm overflowing. I just want to share some of this awesomeness with them so that they can feel it too. So let's say someone comes to you and their life's a mess and they have res so much responsibilities and they need to get to that level where their, their cup is overflowing. How can they, how can they do that if they have, you know, if they have a kid, if they have the, the wife um, and so many responsibilities around that work and, and yep. stress, how do you get them to... So here's what's interesting. I'm married. So with my wife, I luckily figured this out <laughs> and over the last so many years yeah. figured out how to master myself before finding the right person <laughs> yeah. and when I met her in all honesty she didn't know all this framework and technology that I was thinking about and terms I came up with but she was a happy healthy fulfilled human being like she was whole full and abundant and she was spending all her spare time volunteering and giving back and helping others so I was like, dude, like she gets it. <laughs> she doesn't need all this stuff and she just got it. She was there. Um, now, as a couple, when we first got together, we're kind of at level two, stage two, where we're still as a couple very effortful, meaning we have to work at it every single day right now to really make it work. And it doesn't mean our relationship. It means to be happy, healthy, fulfilled, abundant. Like we have to work at that every day. And I, I think if we really get the right rhythms for each other, eventually it'll get to a point where it's effortless. I, I think, I don't know, we're not there yet, but we're kind of the effort full stage. I know as a single person, I did it. Um, so as a couple, if you got together and you never figured yourself out, it's a great thing to do together. You know, both grab a copy of our book or both go to a some, someone seminar and start working on yourself. Or you can do it reading books, you can do it reading blogs. You can go pick up a book for like three bucks or five bucks at the bookstore that's like, things you should know about your partner before you get married and like go through that together. What time do you like to wake up? What do you, what do you love to watch? Like what do you love to learn about? What do you love to do? And all those things and make sure you really match and mesh together as a couple. Some really important things you wanna look for. What do you value most in life? Hmm. What's most important to you above all? What's most important to you? And whenever you ask someone that question, they always tell you the good things. Family, God, giving, being a good person, making a difference, helping out. But if you say, okay, let's figure out what's really most important to you. Take out your schedule and write down hour by hour how you spend your week. Mm -hmm. Now, I just learned what's really most important to you. Why? Money you can get back. Time you can't. So the most precious resource you have on this planet, you write it down of how you invest it every week. I know what you value most. You might not tell yourself that's what you value, but that's how you actually use the most important investment of your life, which is your life. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, if they're like, I value God and family and giving back, and it's like, well, what do you do on Tuesday night? Hit the bar. What do you do on Friday? Hit the club. What do you do on Saturday morning? Hit the pool club. <laughs> You're like, I'm pretty sure I know what you value. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for, for sure. you know yeah. i'm starting to see consistency here yeah, i don't have to wonder anymore like you tell me god and family well if god and family are hanging out at the bar the club and the pool <laughs> that's news to me because that's not where i thought they hung out <laughs> um you know yeah. i value giving back and traveling well when's the last time you traveled like one time when i was 13 my family took a trip and i'm like okay you're 40 that's a long gap between the last time you might have took a trip. <laughs> and it's like you just meet people who do it and you meet people who talk about it. So you want to know what do they really do with their life? And here's the most important part behind that. Not only what they do, two people might say, I love to travel. Yeah. What are the rules for traveling? Meaning for you to really be traveling, what, what has to happen? One person says, I got to save up tons of money. I got to stay at the Four Seasons and I got to have like the best two days of my entire life hanging at the club, drinking, whatever. Mm -hmm. Another person says, it doesn't take any money whatsoever. It takes creativity. You know, I'm going to spend a month in Thailand teaching English. It costs $20 a month US. And I live in a schoolhouse. They provide meals. They provide a place to stay. And every day I'm going to teach and add value to the community. And that's what traveling is. Now, if that couple was together, it's going to be really interesting when it comes to that time to take the first trip. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Different values. Not, no, no, same value. Well, same value, yeah. Mm -hmm. Different rules. Okay. 
Mm. So that's what's tricky is people find someone and go, oh, they have the same values as me. They both love to travel. They both love giving back. They both love being a good person. They both love learning. But they never ask, what are the rules the person has for what traveling means? What are the rules they have for giving back? One person says giving back is writing a check. The other person says that's crap. Giving back is showing up and helping with your own two hands. Mm. Different mm. rules, totally different game. So when you get together as a couple, you got to figure out what do they value? But most importantly, what are their rules? How do you know when you're doing it fully? How do you know when you're really living true to that value? And what's interesting is as you start to see that, you start to see how well it fits together. And as you start to see how it combines, it gives you the ability to now go, oh, okay, well, they have certain rules, I have certain rules, but here's something that most couples never do is those are your rules, these are my rules, what are our rules? What's our rules as a couple? So when we're together, this is the rule book we both choose to play by because we've combined our rules on life together and this is how we play in this house. No one else gets to decide besides us two, but this is how us, we go about life as a couple. Hmm. And that's a beautiful moment because now they've created their own values as a couple. They've created their own rules as a couple combined. Not just separately of those are yours, these are mine, but they've put them together as a couple and said our household us as a team, a unit, this is what we live by because we choose to. It's a very unique moment. Um, but going back to that stage of level one, stage one, if you're already in a relationship and you haven't figured it out, do it together. Mm -hmm. If you happen to have a baby and progress all the way to level three and you never figured out level one, study it. And that way it can be the greatest gift you pay forward to that child. You know, where you figure yourself as a human being and you pass forward all the knowledge along your journey and help them figure it out as soon as possible so that hopefully they figure it out really quickly in life. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great gift to pay forward. I want to talk about, we've spoken a lot about the book and I'd like to talk about hard work um, in achieving whether it's a perfect relationship, the perfect business, the perfect life, however you see it. Can you tell me about the component of hard work? Sure. So falling in love with hard work. Um, that is, hold on one sec. Let me move this. Yeah, yeah. So the process of falling in love with hard work is different for everybody. Um, but, but for me, one thing that was really important about it was it, it's, an, it's something you hear so many times all over the place where people are like, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's about what you learn and who you become. It's not about what you get. And a lot of people, when you hear something like that, you're like, listen, I want to earn a million dollars. Someone's like, okay, we'll figure out who you have to become to earn a million dollars. And you're like, that's nice, but I want the damn money. <laughs> Someone's like, trust me, if I gave you a million dollars today, you wouldn't be happy with it. And the person's like, really? Let's try. <laughs> like, it's hard to convince someone at that moment of their life that they don't want it. Like, no, they want it. <laughs> um, but here's the truth. The only people who know how valuable the journey is are the people who go, have been through it. Because the people who've been through the journey, they figure out there's a really important element to it. And the important element is when you figured out how to build something from nothing, hmm. you have the confidence inside of you and you know the exact steps you took so that if you ever lose it, you have total and absolute confidence. You know how to repeat the process to get the result back. Here's what's interesting. For the person who's given all the wealth, their house or company or knowledge, whatever they're given that they never had to earn themselves, there's always this little tiny fear that lives inside of them that's thinking, man, if I mess this up, I might never be able to give it back because I have no clue how they did it the first time. Hmm. Or I might even know the steps they took, but I'm scared to take them because what if I mess it up because I've never done that before. There's this fear that lives deep inside of people when they haven't done it themselves that does not exist in the people who have gone through the process themselves. Because once you've done it, you're like, oh, pff, I got this. So the purpose of learning how to fall in love with hard work is really looking around in life and going, wow, there's going to be moments that I'm going to have to put in some work I might not want to do. Hmm. I mean, if you're a startup, if you're someone who's going to go grow your own business, there's going to be moments in the beginning when you don't have the funds to hire an accountant that you're going to have to do some accounting work. Yeah. That ain't fun. You know, I hated accounting. I hated it. But I remember the first, you know, year and a half of my business, 
I would have to like get pepped up for accounting sessions on Friday. I would set like a two hour window. I'd go take a run around the block. I'd put my music in. I'd get pumped up. I would like yell and scream and do incantations and get all excited. Yeah. And then I'd like put blaring music in my ears that like kept me fired up. And then I'd open up some spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> And, and as right ridiculous down. as that sounds, <laughs> yeah. no, I, and I would keep my energy up the whole time. I'm like, okay, like five plus seven equals seven. this. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, like numbers. <laughs> that is not my game in life. No. But how do you fall in love with the pro? How do you fall in love with it? You have to. Otherwise, if I just skipped accounting for the first year and a half of my business, I wouldn't have a business. Hmm. Hmm. Why? Because if you don't know the numbers of your business, that's like, that's the blood of your business. That's what keeps it alive. That's the breath of your business. If you don't know the numbers, you're screwed. You're blind. You have no, you have no clue how to steer your ship called business. Hmm. So with business, I had to learn how to fall in love with the process. And there's two main points that really help people fall in love with it. We wrote a Huff part, Post article about this. It's also in our book. There's a whole chapter about it. Um, but, but it really comes down to perception and procedure. The procedure that you physically go about it with so if I would have just sat down on my computer, opened up a spreadsheet, and started working on numbers, mm. it wouldn't have worked. I, would, I literally probably would have bashed my head into the computer screen within like five minutes. It just drives me insane. And a lot of people but do that. They, yeah. Some people can't do it. Other people are like, oh my God, that's my favorite. <laughs> so for those yeah. of you who love it, you're probably looking at me like I'm insane. For those of you who hate it, you're probably like, dude, I feel you. <laughs> So what's interesting is, is, you know, in that moment, not liking numbers, I would have to trick my mind by using a whole routine to get myself into a place where I could enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Go for a run, do some push-ups, get my blood pumping, put on some music, perception. I would have, you know, procedure. I would have to go about it in a way that made it exciting for me, made my heartbeat, made me really get into it, emotionally feel good about it. And then perception, how I looked at it. I had to change my belief system because in the beginning, I was like, this is bull. This is a waste of time. It doesn't even matter. I had all these thoughts and beliefs that were just horrible about it. This is for someone else to do. And eventually, I was like, listen, if I ever want to have a chance of being successful in business, I have to figure this out right now. Mm -hmm. So I had to start telling myself, this is the blood, the breath, the lifeline of my business. This is the most important element. This is the rudder on my ship. If I don't steer this correctly, my ship will crash. I had to come up with all these meanings that were so meaningful to the business that it caused me emotionally to get attached to what it is that we were doing. I had to trick my brain through doing this funky process and telling myself all these thoughts to get into it, to really get myself to go through it. Hmm. Now, what happens is when people take that process and they do, let's say they don't like making sales calls but they get themselves into a state, they have a process that amps them up, and then while they're doing it, they associate meaning, they're like, I'm not selling people, I'm inviting people to an opportunity, I'm giving them this great resource. They trick their mind through the same perception and procedure, all of a sudden these people can do excel, you know, they really excel and do an amazing job at sales calls. Hmm. So you could do it in sales calls, you could do this with accounting like me, you could do this with working out, if you hate working out, you know, you figure out how to fall in love with it through this routine physically you go about that makes it fun and this perception you create of how valuable and awesome and amazing and exciting it is. You can use this for anything. Hmm. But I really had to use perception and procedure of teaching myself how to fall in love with this hard work that I just didn't like in the beginning. And I use the example in the book of learning how to stack lumber. I remember taking a few months in, in summer and moving up to Canada and working at a lumber yard, waking up at 4.30 in the morning, hmm working out in the gym, then going to stack lumber all day, then coming home, working out again in the gym, passing out and doing it again six days a week. And in the beginning, it was easy because I was trying to prove to everyone in my family how tough I was. Halfway through, my mind was flooded with all these crazy beliefs. I'm better than this. I'm smarter than this. I'm more educated than this. Mm -hmm. They owe me. They should be respecting me more here. The world owes me something. I should be getting paid more than this. Entitled. Which are, yeah. Yeah, which is pretty common. If you hear young people in the workplace, you hear them say all these things of themselves. And what's interesting is I remember having a heart to heart conversation with myself in the mirror one day. And I looked myself in the mirror and one by one, I talked to, through these thoughts. I said, they owe me more respect. For what? 
showing up. Like, I'm a joke if I think they owe me respect. I'm the new guy on the team. There is a guy on this team that's been stacking wood for 40 years. I owe him respect. He stacked wood in Canada in, like, negative something degree weather in the snow. And he stacked wood in Dubai in, like, 120 degree weather outside. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I owe that guy massive respect. And he does it to take care of his family. Even more respect I owe him. Number two, I should be getting paid more. <laughs> I'm like, honestly, I wasn't. Well, this was a hard one because I wasn't getting paid. I was working for family. Yeah. If anyone knows how that goes. But I had a great place to stay. They were providing food. It was amazing. And it was an incredible experience. So I just kind of let that one go. I was like, you know, um, I'm smarter than this. I'm more talented than this. And I remember looking at myself in the eye and being like, who do you think you are? You know, they, they should show me more, more respect. And I started looking at everyone and just thinking of why I was thinking that and just turning them around. And as I turned them around, I'm like, honestly, I owe all of these men respect because they're busting their tails to provide for their families. And that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. You know, they're working their ass off to be able to give to the people they love. That's amazing. And I, I said, you know, not only do I owe them respect, but they should be paying attention to me. It's like, I'm, you know, instead of what I'm getting out of this, I should be getting paid more. It's like, I should be adding more value. How do I add more value here instead of trying to get more out of it? And, you know, I, I, I'm smarter than this. It's like, hey, if I'm not the most productive person in this group, how am I smarter than this? How am I more talented than this? There's other people outworking me. Like, I'm, I'm not even proficient, much less excelling. And I remember going back and using this mindset to trick myself into getting into a place that I started to excel. Now, it's a very simplistic job. But again, perception and procedure, how I viewed it and how I showed up, giving, serving, throwing out my best, giving my all, respecting them, serving them, giving to the team. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I think it was like two or three days later, um, I didn't realize this, but my step grandpa had been watching me the whole time. Okay. And he pulled me aside when I got to the house and he said, listen, the employment rate in Canada right now is pretty high. And he says, but I've been watching you the last few days and something changed. I don't know what it is, but you're showing up in a whole different way. And even the foreman who's in charge of your team, he even pointed out that you've really been showing up at a high level. And he said, listen, man to man, you'll never have to worry about having a job because if you ever need one, you have one here. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, was that a, was that a changing point in your life, that moment? Uh, um, Did Whole life, I think it was an important moment. Yeah. Because it was important moment noticing no matter what job you're doing yeah are you really adding that kind of value to your team are you really adding that kind of value to the world or are you just saying hey i showed up the world owes me something or the world should respect me or people should somehow give me something because magically i appeared and and it was a turning point it was a mental shift that caused me to go wow how can i apply this same concept to all of the areas of my life what about in a relationship you know people show up to a relationship and they're like oh this person should respect me or this person should love me or this person should treat me better. It's like this person owes you nothing. Yeah. It's your job to be like, hey, how can I respect them every single day? What do I respect about them even more than the day before? How can I love them even, even more than I love them before? How can I really show up and, and serve them and give to them in ways I've never given before? Now, ideally, you want to find someone who has the same intent and way of showing up towards you. Otherwise, it's kind of a mismatch. Um, but if you find someone who wants to give to you just as much as you want to give to them, that what an awesome match. But it takes that turning point of learning how to fall in love with the processes that make things rich and fulfilling and joyful in life, hmm. which is that whole level one, stage one, stage yeah, two, stage yeah, three yeah. thing. Because when you figure that out for yourself, now you can figure it out for another person and focus on serving them by giving it to them and they can figure it out for you and focus on serving you and giving it to you. And at that point, you've got a wow, world-class relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you've learned a lot from your dad, right? But um, what is, what is, what is, what is, okay. <laughs> but what has he learned from you? Um, I, I, I think it's funny. Him and I went back and forth for a while on I, I called him a workaholic and he called me lazy okay. and so right. we went back and forth on this concept for a while where i was like dude you need to learn how to chill out like meditate yoga relax and yeah. he would come at me and be like dude you need to learn how to work harder like stop being lazy 
Mm. And I remember we go back and forth on this concept. And what's funny, he noticed this first and pointed it out. He says, you know, sometimes the place where you have the greatest tension in life, the greatest frustration is really God trying to give you a gift. Mm -hmm. And he said, honestly, I love my work, so it doesn't feel like work. But if it was work, I'm a workaholic. I do it 24-7 all day long, all the time. And he said, I had this son that I frustrated with all the time because he always wanted me to relax, to chill out, to hang out. And he's like, it bugged the shit out of me until I realized, wow, I'm going to burn myself into the ground if I don't learn how to regenerate like that. And honestly, I used to spend so much time telling him, you need to chill out, you need to relax, you need to you know, meditate. And, and I found myself meditating and doing yoga so often, I'm like, shit, I bet I could work a little bit harder. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. and, and so the gift we shared with each other was his greatest strengths were areas that I could probably improve on. And, and my greatest strengths at that time were areas he could certainly improve on. And I think we've balanced each other out by giving each other that gift where he, he's learned. I saw an article recently where he was meditating on the beach and part of it. And I was like, dude, I haven't seen him do that ever. That's cool. <laughs> and, and I think he called me one time and I don't know, it was like 11 at night or something. And I was traveling and, and he was like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, hey, dad, I literally just landed. I'm sprinting for my next flight. I love you so much. I wish I could talk longer, but I got to go because I'm late for my meeting. And he was like, wow, that's different. He's like, I've never called my son where he was too busy to talk to me. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's funny. It, it's neat to reflect with each other and joke about it because there were definitely times where we were both in balance the opposite way. But I think we've balanced each other out and pushed each other to really find our gaps and figure out how to strengthen each other in the relationship. Mm. What are some of your success, uh, like morning success rituals? Um, before I jump into the actual so morning success rituals, yeah, I would say th there's two rituals everyone needs to have. One is a morning ritual and, and second, an evening ritual. And an evening ritual to start there is it, it's what winds you out of your day. Because something my wife and I noticed is we both love what we do and we will go at it till like 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night until literally we're ready to like pass out and then we'll go to bed and we won't have any energy or time for each other. Hmm. And that's something we realized very early in our relationship. We're like, that won't work. <laughs> if you both show up to bed like, I'm exhausted, I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> like you're done. Like you no energy for each other. How in the world is there supposed to be passion or love or intimacy if you can barely keep your eyes open? And so it's something where we had to figure out, okay, what time do we have to literally draw the line that says we're going to turn it off here to give each other the space to be with each other, to love each other, to mm. connect, to have energy, to have passion, to have, make love, to connect in that way. And so that was important, the evening ritual. And, and the evening ritual basically says, set a time that says, I'm going to step out of the world that everyone else can interrupt me in. I'm going to turn off my phone. I'm going to shut down the television. I'm going to shut down and off the computer. I'm going to step away from everyone else's world. And I'm going to step into our world together. Hmm. We're going to create space, whether it's taking a walk, going to the dog park, um, watching a comedy show together, whether it's taking a bath, giving each other a massage. We're going to do something that's just our space to us and no one else is allowed in. Now, um, I'm probably thinking that someone's going to write, you probably don't have kids yet. That's true. I'm sure it will change. It goes back to level three, stage one. All shit hits the fan. I have no clue how to make that work yet. Um, but I was talking to a gentleman. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. His name is Eric Thomas. Mm -mm. Uh, he's no. the hip hop preacher. He's the guy who did the video that's like, you, if you, the, when you want it as bad as you want to breathe, that's when you'll be successful. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Hmm. He was cool. I was interviewing him yesterday, and I was talking to him, and he said, listen, you got to learn how to get your priorities straight. And someone had raised their hand and said, listen, I'm a startup entrepreneur. Um, I'm married, and I mean, tell me your opinion on this, but isn't there a point that you kind of have to tell, put your, tell your wife or put your relationship and say, hey, I've got to sacrifice some time tonight so that I can build the business so yeah. that the business can take care of us. Yeah, yeah. And Eric looked at him and he says, son, I bet you already know the answer to that question. And he's like, I probably should be spending more time in my relationship, huh? And he's like, that's right. And he's like, but how am I supposed to find the time to build the business when I'm in my relationship? And he says, listen, 
the moment you learn how to make your number one priority actually the number one priority, you will find the way to make everything else fit into the rest of the time you have available. Mm, powerful. The, the yeah. moment you figure out how to make your number one priority really your number one priority, not like halfway priority, not like it should be number one, but absolutely number one no matter what, meaning nothing messes with it. At that point, you'll find a way to make everything else fit in the time. And he goes, let me give you an example. You know, could you be here at 4.30 tomorrow morning, right here in this room? And the guy was like, well, I don't know. I guess I could be. And he's like, not if it was your number one priority to be somewhere else. But I'm sure you could. And what if I give you an incentive? What if I said, I'm going to give you a half million dollars if you show up here at 4.30 in the morning? What time will you be here? The guy's like, 4.30. He's like, no, you wouldn't. You'd be here at 4 a.m. to make sure no one's messing with your money. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? You made it your number one priority to be here. Make your relationship the same way and watch what happens to your business. Mm -hmm. Make your relationship the type of thing that says, hey, when I tell my wife or husband I'm going to be there at this time, nothing interferes. Nothing. You will find a way to make those meetings fit. You will find a way to make those hours work. You will find a way to make everything else get together when you really get your priorities straight. Challenge is most people are still trying to figure out which one's more important. Here's what's crazy. If you started a business at 60, 70, 80 years old, you can still grow it. You know, Mr. KFC, uh, the colonel, started his business at 65 and made it into a multi-million dollar business. Still worldwide known today. KFC all over the world. Um, but you, you can't restart your relationship. You know, you can't buy your little kid going to the, you know, his sixth grade soft baseball game. You can't buy that back. You can't buy going to watch them play football in high school or rugby in, in junior high. Like you can't buy those moments back. You can buy cars. You can buy houses. You can grow your business again. You can't get those moments back. So really, truly learning how to make those priorities number one, talking about the evening ritual saying, hey, my family is number one. And at this time, everything else gets cut off and it's my time to go spend with them so that they know they're number one and I know I get to be there for them when they need me most. Now, the flip side, all the way back up to the morning ritual, when most people wake up, I rarely meet people who like the moment their eyes open, jump out of bed going, oh my God, it's life. Let's do this. Yeah. Like that's not how the average person wakes up. Most people wake up and they're like, oh my God, what happened? Oh, okay. Uh, shit, what time is it? What are we doing? Oh, geez, what do I have to do? Like That's how most people wake up. They don't like come flying out of bed. They're not stoked on life. Some are. God bless them. High five. They're amazing. Yeah. I, teach me your skills because I don't know that. Um, but even me, I wake up. I'm like, oh, what happened? Like, oh, my God, I'm awake. Okay, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> it takes some, you know, you got to kind of start the engine of your life and you got to get going. And so some rituals I have, if you look right behind me, there's vision boards right up here. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is actually the desk for a treadmill desk. So there's a treadmill underneath that. Okay. And so I actually get up. I'll walk right over here. First, my wife and I meditate for 20 minutes together. We think connect with each other first. So we 20 minutes, we do meditation over in our room. We have a meditation station where we sit together and meditate in that space. Then we say a prayer. At that point, I come in here. I jump on the treadmill for about 20, 30 minutes. And I go through my morning routine. Morning routine, really simple. The first like three, five minutes is just gratitude. Everything I'm grateful for in life because mm. it kind of resets your nervous system to forget about all the stuff you have to do, to forget about all the challenges, to forget about the good and bad moments. It just resets you and like blisses you out in that moment because you feel really good and abundant about your life. So three to five minutes of gratitude, then three to five minutes of what I'm really excited about out loud. So all the things I'm excited to obtain and, and achieve and experience. And what happens is I go down a list in order where I say, okay, my 20-year vision for my life is to do this, 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 this. My 10-year vision, then my five-year vision, then my one-year vision, then my six-month vision, then my you know three-month goals, then my one-month goals, then my weekly goals. Then I spend time mentally rehearsing, which is different than visualizing. Mm -hmm. You know, visualizing is seeing the perfect image of what's happening out in the future, mm -hmm. but I, I then spend time mentally rehearsing, which is literally like what boxers do before their fight. Because okay. if you were to visualize like the perfect boxing match, you'd see yourself hitting the guy perfectly and then never getting touched. Now, th that's awesome. I like the visualization. It's very positive. The problem is it's not very realistic. 
Because what's the likelihood you're going to get in the ring, go to box someone, and they're never going to hit you once during the whole match? You're boxing. They're going to hit you. Okay, so we're talking about a morning routine. Just to break it down one more time from the beginning is my wife and I wake up in the morning, and the first thing we do is we meditate. We have something we call a meditation station, which is over in our room, and it's a little love seat. We have a little cool table with like intention cards and candles and like stuff that just makes us feel good. We also have um, a... Himalayan salt crystal rock can't, uh, light that's there, which, which creates some negative ions in the room, which which really kind of, according to the philosophy behind the people who sold it to us, it's supposed to kind of neutralize out all of the cell phone energy and electronic energy in the house. Mm -hmm. And so we try to create the most peaceful little place possible that we can go every day to really just connect and to meditate and center ourselves before our day. Um, directly after meditation, we spend some time just saying a prayer and we pray for our friends. We pray for our family. We pray for our day. We pray for our health. We just pray for the most important things, mm -hmm. um, kind of in setting that intention. And then immediately after that, I head right into my office and I have this really awesome treadmill desk in here. And so I have these cool vision boards set up on top of my treadmill desk and I jump on that and I spend the next about 30 minutes roughly um, doing some affirmations, incantations, and there's a very specific process I use where the first three to five minutes is really just saying gratitude. It's kind of a reset to my nervous system to reconnect with what's most important to me, to flood my body with what I'm grateful for so that I can really feel inside um, just that abundance of what already positively and amazingly exists in my life. It kind of resets your nervous system in a good way. So three to five minutes of gratitude and, and real simple. Like I'm, I'm so grateful for what I can see. I'm grateful for what I can feel. I'm grateful for the, body, you know, the ability that I can hear things. I'm grateful for my family, my friends, my life, the ability to travel, give back, make a difference. I'm so grateful for my wife, our love, uh, just simple things. But when you do that for like three to five minutes, literally you just feel totally abundant and rich inside afterwards. So do that step. The next step is what I'm really excited about from now and in the future and so I spent about the next maybe 10 minutes going through like one minute speaking out loud all of my 20 year vision and goals for my life. So I would say, you know, I'm so grateful that at 50 years old, I'm more healthy than more, the average 20 year old in the world. My wife's love and passion for each other grows daily. When we're together, anything is possible. I'm so grateful we generate over $100 million from our 10 plus world class companies. You know, I'm so grateful we celebrate our profit by investing in our hospital, which serves 1,000 plus people per month, and our schools, which educate 10,000 children per month worldwide. We are guided in faith in all that we do. Hmm. And so, like, I repeat this to myself as a phrase again and again and again about the next 20 years of my life. Then I do the 10 year vision. Then I do the five year vision. Then I do the one year vision. Then I do the six month vision. Then I do the three month goals, the month goals, the week goals. And then I do, I switch. Mm -hmm. And this next step I switch to goes from visualizing this perfect, ideal, amazing outcome to now mentally rehearsing what I see is about to happen. And the difference between visualization and mental rehearsal is huge. Visualization is basically seeing ideally what you want to have happen in the world as if it's like perfectly happening with no disruptions, just perfectly happening the exact way you want it to happen. Mental rehearsal is seeing what's going to happen and the reality of what might happen. So boxers use this before boxing match. Muhammad Ali was one of the most famous boxers who used this process to prepare for his boxing matches. And what he would do is he would imagine himself get in the ring, start landing his punches perfectly and just like, bam, 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 just nailing them. Then he would see himself face an obstacle of getting hit really hard and be like, oh, right in my ribs. Then he would see himself breathe and successfully make it through the obstacle in that moment. Now, this is important because... If you go to go face your day and you see this perfect vision of what you're going to do with your life and you go out to face your day and then one little obstacle shows up and all of a sudden it just grounds you and you get knocked out at your breath and you don't know what to do and you just give up because you weren't prepared for obstacles. You weren't prepared for a challenge. You weren't prepared for life to push back in any way versus if you're prepared for life to push back and you've seen something that could possibly go wrong and mentally seen yourself get hit by it, stand back up, take a breath and just move through it, 
Now, when that obstacle shows up, you successfully go, no big deal, stand right back up and keep moving forward and stay focused on mission and congruent with what you need to do to get what you need done, done. Mm -hmm. So that mental rehearsal is the next step for five minutes, mentally rehearsing my day, seeing the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that's going to happen, see myself successfully accomplishing the goals, successfully making it through the obstacles, successfully you know, achieving the results all throughout the day. And then I go do it. But before I get off the treadmill, the next 10 minutes is using incantations or affirmations, whatever you want to call them. Um, but it's it, it really been getting myself kind of into an emotional frenzy connected to what I want to do and who I am in the world. And my incantation for whatever it's worth to people out there is, you know, I'm an open channel for God. His love flows through me, filling the room, filling the hearts, touching the souls of everyone around me daily. And while I say that, I imagine myself, my body, who I am as a person being open and having all the universe, mother nature, God's energy flowing through me, reaching out and hitting people exactly when they need it most in their life, their business, their health, or however I'm going to come across them in their life that day. Hmm. And so after literally 10 minutes of that, my day is ready. And you could imagine after doing that every morning or something like it, some routine that really fits your style, what happens is you're so filled up and fueled up that you can take the pressure of life. The best example I give is if, it give is if you took like a soda can and if you open up the soda can and poured out half the can, even if you hand it to a small child, the small child can dent it, if not crush it with its bare hands. Hmm. But if you take the same can and you seal it, you fill it up all the way to the top and then you pressure seal it, you give it back to the same child, he really doesn't even stand a chance at denting it or crushing it with his own hands. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference? It's the same thing of how people show up to life. Some people wake up half empty or even completely empty emotionally. They walk out into the world, the one little tiny thing goes wrong and it immediately crushes them in, in their day. Other people have some type of routine like this in the morning that they spend filling up, fueling up, preparing yourself mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually for life, getting yourself sealed and pressurized from the inside out. Now you go out into the world, the world can take its best shot at you and it won't even dent you because you have so much awesomeness pushing out mm -hmm. that it's very difficult for anything to push in. So it's kind of like you're creating this thick skin. Thick skin, force field, yeah. pressurized, I don't know what you want to call it, but it's literally exactly, you're building this layer of energy around you mm. so that it makes you almost like invincible to the pressures of life. It's kind of like what Steve Jobs described as the reality distortion field. Exactly. Mm. Mm. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm sure it's exactly <laughs> what it was. Um, so how do you overcome obstacles? Does this link, um, does this link in with it? Well, here's the fun part. If you're naturally in that powerful frame of mind, like think of a time when you had a major, major, major victory in life. Like you were at the top of your game. You were feeling your best. You were pumped up. It's like, oh, we did it. Now, someone can come to you with a crazy big obstacle at that moment. And it feels like what? Like when you're at your best. Hmm. Usually, it, usually it feels like no big deal. It's easy. Like who, it's a, it's a who's your who's your favorite rugby team? Um, I'm not big on the rugby. Oh, who's no. your favorite? What's your favorite sport? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite sport. I've been watching like the World Cup soccer. Perfect. Who's your favorite team for World Cup soccer? Well, I've been I've been going for Australia, but my second team that I was going for, I was actually going for Colombia in the World okay, Cup. Okay, Colombia or Australia. Yeah. Let's say you were at the game. And Colombia or Australia wins the World Cup. Yeah. Like, you'd be going nuts. You'd be like, Crazy. oh, my God, we did it. We did it. We did it. Ah. Crazy. Now, at that point, someone's like, oh, hey, guess what? Someone stole your car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't really. Would it be like, oh, my oh. God, my life is over. This sucks. I got to go home. This is horrible. Or to be like, who cares? We won. Yeah, I'll figure it out later. No problem. It'll be the second. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why? Because the only difference is you're at your best. Hmm. Now, let's say you're at work. You're frustrated already. Deals aren't coming through as you thought they would. You're kind of like half empty already. And someone comes in and be like, hey, man, sorry. When I pulled in, I accidentally scratched your car. 
Mm. <laughs> no one stole it. I mean, the, you, your team wins the World Cup. Someone steals your car, you don't care. Mm. Now, you're half empty. Someone even slightly scratches your car. <sighs> feels like your whole day ends. You're like, gosh darn it, this is stupid. Ah. Now, this is a silly analogy, but little tiny things happen and throw this person's world into a tailspin because they're not filled up inside. Mm. Versus when someone's mm. filled up inside and they're at their best, huge catastrophes could happen and it doesn't even affect them. So how do you fill up and fuel up every day is so important. I use that morning routine because that's what works for me. But for some people it's meditating, for some people it's working out, for some people it's being with their family, but what is it for you listening in? What is it for you that when you do that every day, it fills you up and pressurizes you from the inside out so that you can take on all the pressures of life without ever feeling them or without ever getting crushed by them. Now, whatever that routine is for you, A, figure it out and define it. B, do it every day. Get yourself into a place. And you can have like five different routines. You don't have to have one, but come up with the routines necessary for you to do every morning that makes you your best self. So that when you take on the world, you have what it takes to make it through all the challenge and obstacles life throws your way. Yeah, I love that. Um, what are some What are some books that you're currently reading that inspire you? Oh man, I got a ton of books. Um, let's see. I have Habits. I'm going back through that. I have. Hold on. I'll be right back. There's a bunch of them right mm -hmm. behind. Me. Let me Let me see what's have up a, here. Have a look. Take. Um, I Oh, another one that came to mind I'm listening to right now, which is The Way of the Seal by Mark Devine. It's an ex-Navy SEAL. Okay. What's funny is I've been reading this book and I posted a quote and a friend of mine who's a chief master sergeant in the U.S. Air Force, he, he, tech, he emailed me. He's like, hey, if I can get you actually to go train with the SEALs for three days, would you do it? Okay. And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So there's a yeah. chance next week he's, he's in Washington, D.C. talking to someone high up. There's a chance I might get to go train with the SEALs for like three days at some point in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so if you don't hear me on a podcast for a while, you know what happened. <laughs> Let's, so Habits by uh, Charles Duhigg I have read up here. Um, Power versus Force is a book I go through every so often just to re-tap into that and make sure I'm coming from a place of power, not force in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, my dad's new book, uh, Money, Master the Game. I'm, I'm definitely going through that at this point. Um, what else is up here? I think those are the ones up there. I have a book on coaching inside of corporations that I'm reading from the Ken Blanchard Company. It's really good. And then, like I said, I just ordered 11 books on coaching and practice of coaching and the law and ethics of coaching. So I have a ton of books coming my way. Um, book Yourself Solid was a really good book I was reading recently, just how to book more clients for coaches. I get a lot of coaches who hired me as their coach. And one thing is always like, how do I get more clients? So I, I read books on, on marketing and business for coaches just to better understand more techniques I could share with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I share everything obviously we're doing because it's working, we're crushing it. But for other coaches, I come up with more ideas that maybe it's not the exact way we do it, but maybe it's an idea they could use that would help their business really blow up in a good way. Mm. What are some of your favorite podcasts? Oh, I got to give a big shout out to my buddy, Lewis House. Mm -hmm. uh, School of Greatness, definitely up there. Uh, James Altucher, thank you for having us on your show, the James Altucher Show. Definitely a great podcast to listen into for business people. Uh, School of Greatness, motivation, personal development, growth, people doing amazing world-class things in the world. Um, what was another one that I really liked? Obviously, there's this really, really, really amazing one I like listening to called it's Learn It, Live It, Give It with Jarek Robbins. If you haven't heard about it, it's probably one of the best up there. It's not really rated on the charts that often, but I'm telling you, it's worth listening to. Um, what? I think those are the... Oh, uh, Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Definitely love some Tim, Tim Ferriss from time to time. Mm. Definitely fun to tune in there. Um, I'm trying to think of what other ones really I have. I think those are the main ones I kind of tune into. Uh, Joe Polish and marketing. I, I like tuning in and listening. I think it's called the 10X Factor. Mm-hmm. Um, I also like like 60 second science. I don't know why I love random science facts. So, so tuning in and listening to like random science facts each day is kind of fun. It's 60 seconds. I was like, why not? One minute of my life. I learned something cool. Done. <laughs> um, you're a speaker, author, coach, um, and you're, you're impacting a lot of people right now. What would you like your legacy to be? Oh man. I like, imagine, I just, imagine until, imagine 
it's it's pretty deep. But imagine you're you're like funeral and people are talking about you. What would they say? What did Jerick Robbins leave behind? Um, there's there's two things that I'd say about this. One, uh, there's a phrase that represents what I want my legacy to be that we live by, and and I'll sum that up really easy at the end. Um, sure. but beyond that phrase, it, it's something that hit me a while ago, and I remember at one point, um, I remember at one point thinking about you know if I were to die tomorrow the values I'm representing by the way I'm choosing to live and invest my time and invest my life and invest my energy and invest my thoughts and invest my money, would I be proud of who I was if I, if I were to die tomorrow? And I remember it was a time of life when I was like, you know, trying to get the next coolest, best thing, whether it was saving up for a house or buying a new fancy sports car. Or I remember at one point I bought a car, it was really cool, BMW, V8 twin turbo, mm. five liter V8 engine. I mean, it went as an SUV, it went zero to 60 in four seconds. Like, it was a badass SUV. <laughs> uh, it's faster than most cars, but as an SUV, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, super fun. And I remember at one point looking at it, and it was cool, and I loved it. And it was fun to drive around and have fun with. And I remember looking at it and being like, if I died tomorrow, would I be proud of this? Like, if there was just a picture next me next to my car, would I be really proud of who I was and what I you know, how I represented life on this planet. And I was kind of like, not really. I don't, I don't think I'd be really, really, really proud of that. It'd be cool, but I don't know if I'd be really proud of that. I'm more than that. And I remember sitting down and looking at my finances and just thinking about how I was spending resources in my life, I was investing my time, my energy, my thoughts, my life. And I remember thinking, you know, what could I invest my life into that if I were to die the next day, I would be damn proud I was doing that when I went out. Hmm. And I, at that point, I, I literally just got rid of the car, actually, as silly as it sounds. Um, my wife and I moved from California to Florida because there's better tax advantages there. Mm -hmm. And then we started giving significantly to nonprofits and, and investing in building schools. And we built our first school last year as a couple where we, we helped fundraise and donated ourselves together. Um, so all the people who helped out, thank you so much. And to us, we threw in money as much as we could. And, and it was about $10,000 and we raised enough money to build a school. And uh, they, they built the actual physical school we paid for in China, in rural China. Mm. And I remember thinking if I were to die tomorrow after building that school, I'd be damn proud of myself because even when I'm no longer here, there's going to be dozens of kids that for years to come will be able to have an education because my wife and I just cared enough to do something about it. And I remember being like, that's cool. That's really cool. That's something I could die proud of. And so I constantly now look for things, look for projects, look for opportunities to invest in um, my time, my energy, my thought, my emotion, um, marketing towards them. And right now we have another school we're building. This time we've upped our game from just 10,000 to 25,000 through a different organization called Pencils of Promise. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful organization. My friend Adam started it with $25 and he's built it up to over 250 schools in five years. He's built all over the world. And they don't just build schools and leave them there. They build schools and then they actually follow up and train and educate and help partial fund the teachers to make sure that they stay up and really perform well as a school. And so this year we're donating $25,000. We're at about 10% of it right now. Um, if people listening want to help us out and join our team, you can do so at uh, learnitliveitgiveit.com. And you're welcome to join our team. You're welcome to donate towards our school and help out. But we're going to build our second school this year. And our goal is to build enough schools so that at some point in the way, way, way future, probably you know 20 years from now, uh, we've built enough schools that 10,000 children a month worldwide could be going to one of the schools that we've helped build. And my thought is if, you know, that's something we left behind on this planet, my wife and I feel that that's a, a worthy effort. And considering we're both only 30 years old and already on our second school, we're, we're pretty proud of ourselves. And we're, we're really grateful to all the people who've helped out and chipped in. Um, but my legacy beyond that, I, I, you know, the cherry on top that I eventually want to build is I remember when I was sick and I had um, malaria living in a Ugandan village. The village didn't have a whole lot of supplies and it sure as heck didn't have like an equipped hospital to handle stuff like that. So at some point in the future, I want to want to be able to fund a full hospital in a place that needs it most in the world and staff it and pay, to, pay for the staff every month. I think a number that blew my mind was 
um, a full-time doctor at a Ugandan hospital or clinic only costs $1,600 a month US. Hmm. I was like, wow, what a lot of people pay for rent in an apartment, you could be paying a full-time salary for a doctor that could be helping thousands of people a month. And so I thought about that. And so that's something eventually I want to help build a, a, a hospital or a clinic and then staff it full time and pay for everyone to be there so that they can help people. And, and we would just provide that service to the community who needs it. I think that'd be a beautiful, beautiful legacy gift we could leave behind. Um, but the phrase that sums up what I feel my legacy and what I feel my ripple on this planet will be is, is really simple. It's learn it, live it, give it. And I think if I can inspire more people to go out and learn what it takes to live their ideal day and live their ideal life. Um, not only inspire them to learn it, but inspire them really to live it. it. Put those ideas into motion and allow their life to become their message so that how they live their life and who they are speak so loud that you know they don't have to say a word. People just watch how they live and go, wow, I want some of that. Like That's cool. And, and not cool because it's flashy, but cool because there's meaning and purpose and, and fulfillment behind it that's really solid as a human being. Um, and the final piece is give it. I, I hope I inspire those people to not only learn what it takes, but inspire them to actually do it and you know turn their vision into reality. But I, I hope I inspire them in the future to to pay it forward and find a way to help others and, and give to others in some unique way that pays forward that message of what they've learned and what works for them to let other people figure out if it might work for them as well. Jarek, is there anything is there anything before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Um, I think the simplest thing is if you're someone trying to master, you know, that stage one of life or level one of life, stage one, two or three, uh, go grab a copy of our book. Our, our website's really simple. I'm sure you'll have the link there, but it's just livitbook.com. Mm. Um, it's endorsed by Brian Tracy, Deepak Chopra, uh, Keith Frazzi, Adam Braun, all kinds of people backed it up. Mm. It's a great book. It's solid. It's simple. I think of it as kind of like a user manual for that first stage of life of figuring yourself out because it shows you step by step by step exactly how to get it done. Um, the other thing we're, we're going to be doing is probably in the near future, we're going to start certifying people on how to coach other people through that process. So if anyone's interested in something like that, they're welcome to go to uh, jerickrobbins.com forward slash certification. And we're looking for other people who want to not only master the concept in their own life, but really be able to walk another young man or woman through the process to help them get it in their life as well. So we're going to be putting that up and, and hopefully finding some people who want to go through the course and learn how to do it so that they can pay it forward if, if they're in that position already in their life. Um, besides that, maybe join our fundraiser and help us build that school at learnandliveitgiveit.com. That'd be wonderful. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah. It's, um, it's been a pleasure yeah. having you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure being here. If you genuinely want to take your life to the next level, then you got to hit the reset button. 